Okay, so uh, first off, I would like to thank Aligarithmic for inviting me here. Uh, I'm really super happy to be at the GDC. Uh, and I also would like to thank all of you for being here today. Um, so today we're going to talk about creating hard surface materials with Substance Designer. So my name is Jonathan Benainous. Uh, I'm originally from France and I'm senior texture artist, currently working for uh, WB Games Montreal. Um, I started in the video game industry about 13 years ago. Uh, I worked on a bunch of AAA games such as EV Rain and Beyond Two Souls at Quantic Dream. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn at Guerrilla Games, and Ghost Recon Wildlands and Assassin's Creed Odyssey at Ubisoft. Uh, if you want to see more of my personal work, you can check out my portfolio on ArtStation or give me a follow on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, if you, have a, you can also send me an email if you have any question or if anything wasn't clear during this talk, just uh, feel free to contact me. All right, so today we're going to take a look at two project breakdown. So, um, the first part will be about uh, creating a baroque ceiling fully in Substance Designer. Uh, this part of the presentation will be more focused on the pipeline and method. So the target here is to uh, create an intricate baroque ceiling inspired by the church Santa Maria in Araqueli. Uh, in the second part, we're going to take a look at a second project breakdown. Uh, and will be about creating a damage, a damage wall fully in Substance Designer. Uh, here the focus will be more on the height and albedo creation with more tips and tricks. And the target here is to uh, create a realistic damage painted wall with sci-fi markings and logos inspired by the game Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. And in the end we will have some Q&A &A if, if we still have some time. All right, so how it all started. So uh, basically I started to use Substance Designer uh, back in 2015. So I spent the most of my career as a senior environment artist. And uh, after many years uh, using Maya and the Hyper Shade I, uh, uh, to create um, shaders and material, I quickly felt comfortable when I started to use uh, Substance Designer. Um, since I had the opportunity to use it on production, such as Ghost Recon Wildlands, or more recently on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I knew that it was also about uh, personal learning. So uh, in the meantime, I kept working on personal projects in my free time to uh, practice and keep exploring the tool. Uh, I knew that experimenting in designer was really key to level up, so I uh, constantly challenged myself uh, on new projects without having any constraint of deadlines. So here's a short video showcasing some of my personal work from my portfolio. Uh, so except for my sci-fi helmet where I use ZBrush for the sculpt and uh, a few uh, skulls and bones that I Z-grab for my hornet column, uh, everything has been fully made uh, in Substance Designer. There you go.
so about my workflow, uh, usually when I start working on a material, um, I start by creating the height and the normal first. So a good height map is the foundation of quality materials. Uh, so the most of the time, I always uh, um, work with a gray albedo to really stay focused on the sculpt. And I work from left to right and from large to small shapes. I also use displacement all the time to preview my height in 3D. Uh, visualizing your 2D texture as a 3D volume. So here what you need to have in mind is that uh, basically the height map is the sculpting step in Designer and you're basically adding and subtracting grayscale shapes. Uh, and it's really important to have an eye on the 3D view to really check what you're doing with displacement and to be sure to have something appealing from every angle. I also work uh, with uh, ambient occlusion uh, very early in the process with an HBL node with default setting just to help me out to uh, visualize more of my volumes. I also create my components and materials first. So basically if I'm creating a, a forest ground, I'm gonna tackle the pebbles, the branches, and the leaves first. Uh, same for the material, I'm gonna work on the sand, the snow, the mud, the concrete, the paint, etc. I also work with multiple subgraphs, so it helps me to stay organized and efficient. It optimizes the main graph, and it's also e easy to extract components. So for instance, uh, if you're creating a muddy grant and a few months back you've created a forest grant, you can just go back to that file and grab a bunch of subgraphs just to uh, avoid to restart from scratch. And finally, uh, creating masks out of my height to generate the other maps. Uh, so as I said, the, the height is really like the, the base and the foundation of good quality materials because it's going to be the, the map that you're going to use to extract all the other information to create your albedo, your roughness, and your metallic. All right, so uh, project breakdown number one, uh, creating a baroque ceiling fully in substance designer. So here are a few renders, uh, rendered in Marmos at Tilbeck 3. So basically the goal of this project was really to uh, challenge myself on creating intricate shapes and patterns in Substance Designer without using any external 3D programs. So basically I played around with SD to practice on finding uh, workaround and new techniques to make complex components. So uh, I really learned a lot on that project and uh, I even learned stuff that I'm reusing on organic materials. So uh, I truly recommend you to play around with the program uh, and just try to go out of your comfort zone um, on creating like crazy materials. Um, I'm pretty sure that you're gonna learn a lot as well. So uh, the project pipeline for this project. So first uh, I get to find uh, inspiration and analyze uh, references. Then I needed to uh, set up a plan. Uh, I had to create the, the height map. I had to combine my elements and to uh, create the albedo roughness in metallic. All right, so inspiration, uh, reference, reference analysis. So here's a reference board with a multi-angle. So uh, it's something pretty common when you start working on a 3D project, you always like uh, gather references, but what I like to do is really like collect a lot of ref references from the same place with a lot of uh, different angles and uh, sort of different lighting as well, if I can find that. Uh, I usually on that project find a bunch of uh, video to get more, uh, uh, some close up on some details, so it was super useful. And uh, just to give you a bit of background, uh, it all started a few years back after a trip to Rome. So. Uh, I had the, the chance to go there and I visited a, a lot of monuments and I really, I've been blown away by the, the, amount of de uh, the amount of detail and the profusion of details inside all the, the barrack interiors. So um, I, since that time I had the idea to uh, create a, a 3D project inspired by this uh, barrack interiors. So uh, I just gathered a few pictures from the, the places I had visited and I finally decided to pick the the ceiling of the church Santa Maria in Araqueli as a main reference. Uh, so if you have the chance to go there one day, it's really one of the most uh, impressive coffered ceiling in the world. Uh, and if you love architecture, just uh, go to Rome. <laughs> um, so this is the section that I love the most uh, on the ceiling. And these are my uh, two key references. So um, uh, they were like the most inspiring 
section of the of the ceiling for me, and I also uh, like the colors with the contrast with the the flashy red and the dark blue, and uh, I also love the composition. So before to uh, tackle the material, basically we need to uh, study and identify the main elements. So uh, if we take a look at the reference, we have ornate cornices who frame the wool bas relief. We have circular ornaments and moldings. We have a big blazon. Uh, we have crown. We have two keys attached by ropes. We have sheriffs with wings. We have festoons and many more elements. Um, so if you compare the reference on the left and the render that I've, uh, I've done on the right, uh, you can see that it's not only about like reproducing a reference, but it's also about uh, design. So uh, if you look at the two images on the left, the two close up, uh, you can see that I uh, kept the top part from the keys on the left and the crown. Uh, and I kept the key ring, the volute, and the tiny shared face from the right. And uh, I kept the, the bottom part under the blazon from, from the left. And um, I just created a mix of uh, the, the, two, uh, the two best elements that I love the most. I also used a, an architecture glossary. Uh, so in this project, I really used a lot of documentation to help me out to understand and figure out some patterns. And uh, also, uh, in architecture, everything has a name, so uh, it can be very useful to know this name to uh, find more references on the internet. All right, so um, I uh, needed to set up a plan before to start working on the material. So. <clears throat> As this project is very complex, <laughs> I decided to uh, separate all the elements uh, previously mentioned in separate graph to help me to stay organized. So here the height map is made out of 30 subgraphs combined together. So yeah, that's a pretty big explorer. <laughs> all right, so uh, let's take a look at my main steps. So uh, creating the layout of the structure, the cornices, and the different floors creating the trim patterns and the circular moldings, then creating the different components, uh, blending all the elements together in the main graph, and creating the albedo, uh, roughness, and metallic out of masks. All right, so creating the height map. So basically, I started uh, to make a black and white mask corresponding to my first floor in Designer. So I uh, added and subtracted uh, square shapes, and I ended up with the mask that you have on the right. Then if you remember well my, on my references, uh, each floor uh, is, is framed by uh, cornices. So um, I could have created like all these cornices separately, but it was uh, super fast to use to, plas to place that by hand. So uh, I find a technique uh, by uh, basically using a bevel node. So I created like a, a, a slope around my floor and uh, basically the, flow, uh, the bevel uh, control the thickness of the, the cornice and uh, the curve node that I use after is like uh, helping me out to control the, the design of that cornice. So I ended up with this kind of result. So once again, the bevel controlled the thickness and the curve node, the, the profile. So I end up with this kind of result. So you can see that on the modeling on the right, if you slice the mesh, you can clearly see that it's exactly the same uh, silhouette that you, you have on the curve node on the left. So it's a, it's a pretty useful node uh, if you're not familiar with the curve node. So you can just do a lot of crazy thing with it. And here's a breakdown of the first steps. <clears throat> So basically, I used the same process on the following floors. So uh, I added the other boxes, uh, so the one with the T-shape and the one with the cross shape to complete my layout. And um, here it was pretty important to check the tiling in the 2D view uh, to be sure that my square shapes were all uh, aligned together and that the, the layout was well respected. So here I had to do some back and forth just to, just to tweak my bevel and be sure that everything was uh, uh, was nice and clean, and just uh, 
to illustrate the tiling topic, here's the final material just applied on a rounded cube. So you can see that on the right, uh, when it's tiled two times, uh, the, the seam is, is pretty interesting, the composition is cool as well. And one more breakdown. So now that we have uh, our structure, uh, I had to create a, a bunch of trim patterns to cover my cornices. So uh, let's take a look at the first one. So I just want to spread, it's pretty simple. So I use a, a crescent as a base. Uh, I plug that in an histogram scan to uh, create a black and white mask. I then uh, squash the, the shape using a transform. Then I keep, you know, uh, blending the, the two shapes together and I end up with the, the pattern that you have there, so nothing crazy. Uh, here it's a pattern, uh, pretty common that you can see on pretty much every neoclassical uh, monuments. And uh, it was pretty fun to try to uh, do it in designer. So once again, I started with a crescent. Uh, I once again use an histogram scan, uh, a symmetry node. Uh, then I use an edge detect to create uh, that, uh, that line. Uh, and I'm blending the two shapes together. Uh, I add some roundness with a bevel. And uh, down at the bottom, I'm, I'm creating a leaf that I'm like merging with the, the previous shape. So that's pretty much it for that. And here's a, a pattern, slightly more complicated, but slightly. <laughs> but uh, uh, once again, this time I started with a crescent. Uh, I really love that, that shape, basically. Um, when you, you plug that into an Instagram scan, you get a, a sort of uh, egg shape, and it can be like a, a super good base to uh, create leaves. And here, this is how I created my leaves, basically. So I just uh, subtracted a bunch of uh, ridge bell shapes just to create like the subtle details on the surface of the leaves. I uh, just played around with a bunch of transform after that, uh, plugged that in a tile sampler. And uh, for the ribbons, I uh, created the border with a, a disc shape. And yeah. All right, so um, now I got to you know, place my, all my patterns along my cornices. So I just used blend nodes, then I've uh, blended, uh, then I set to screen, uh, add or max lighting, depending of the, the wanted effect. And to help me out uh, in, in, in this operation, I basically uh, use a, a node called light node. And um, it's a node that has, is, is uh, basically using your normal information to uh, generate a mask that simulate the, the orientation of a virtual spotlight. So this is very useful in our, in our case just to uh, isolate or slope and uh, sort of create uh, automatic masks. And uh, here is a look at the, the height map with all the trim patterns uh, in place. So for the circular molding now, uh, basically the two that you have on the, on the left are, pre are, are pretty simple. I just used a parabolate plugged into a curve node. And for the bigger ones that you have on the right, uh, I use a multiple splatter circular um, uh, layered on top of each other's. Uh, I also had to create a bunch of uh, corner moldings. Uh, so um, he was useful just to hide the seam between the horizontal and vertical junction of my different trim patterns. So here's an overview of the, the two graph. So, uh, Nothing crazy, I just had to create like a, a version for the interior and the exterior. So you have like corner cubes and corner leaves. And once again, a breakdown of the following steps. <clears throat> All right, so now uh, we had to create the different components. So uh, here's a breakdown of the shared face, so uh, it's that's been fully made in designer. So once again, it was uh, pretty fun to uh, play around with the program to uh, find a way to create the face. Um, here's a breakdown with a small GIF. Um, so basically here, uh, to, I started by creating the face and I only uh, use uh, disc shapes uh, to um, create the silhouette of my face first. Then I use a non-uniform blur grayscale to uh, create my volume and make the, the shape pops out. 
And I kept adding and subtracting other shapes uh, for the orbit, the eye, uh, the nose, the mouth, etc. And uh, we're not going to go through the wool graph, but that's a pretty big one. Uh, there's a lot of transform and uh, manual operation, but uh, this is the only way, basically. <laughs> All right, so here's a breakdown for the vase. And once again, a GIF. So uh, basically for the vase, I started by creating the, the neck using a, a square shape, uh, and I subtracted uh, two discs in symmetry. Then for the, the belly of the pot, I use a paraboloid, then I have a, uh, and I set the roundness with a level. And uh, for the flames on top, I basically use a, a succession of waveform one that I've directional warp to get a, a, a subtle undulation. And um, for the rebounds on the, on the both sides, uh, I created the border of the shape using a, an edge detect. And for the, the perspective effect, I used a, a FX uh, perspective node that is available on Substance Shear and uh, that have been created by uh, Alexander Prokopchuk, so, uh, and it's free, so uh, just uh, enjoy. <laughs> All right, so for the keys and crown, uh, here's an overview of the different elements, and here's a breakdown of the key. So here, uh, I started by uh, creating a volute that I plugged into a uh, splatter circular, so I created the keyring first, then for the stem, uh, I use a gradient linear two that I've upscaled in here and there just to uh, create nice, uh, nice details. And you have an overview of the, the wool graph with the other components. All right, so for the wings, uh, it was a pretty difficult asset to create, so uh, I decided to uh, uh, break it up into, uh, into smaller pieces. So you have uh, long feathers on the left, you have a sort of plumage at the bottom, and you have uh, smaller feathers on the right. So here is a look at the, this part of the graph. So um, I started by uh, combining a square and this shape together uh, to create lines, uh, to have a, a base for my, uh, my long feathers, and I started to uh, blur them slightly. Then I used a, a ridge belt to create a, a smooth groove in the center. And uh, still using a ridge belt, I started to uh, draw uh, thin stripes in diagonal, just to add uh, tiny details on the, on the surface. And uh, if you look at the graph, you can see that um, basically I worked on the, on the um, I worked on it like straight, and I banded the shape at the very end with a directional warp. So, uh, it was uh, pretty useful to just uh, work that way instead of like bending it from the very beginning. And here's a look at the wool graph. So you have the long feathers at the top, the feathers in the center, and the plumage at the bottom. So a lot of transform, a lot of work with the levels. Uh, so everything is basically um, uh, blended in max lighting. So uh, it was important to uh, really work hard on the the settings of the level and be sure that everything was nice. So combining the elements, here is a breakdown of the construction of the, the height map. So here I really try to uh, keep a consistent depth between uh, all the assets of my composition. Uh, so uh, the height map had to be appealing from every angle, and I also needed to uh, minimize the stretching as much as, much as possible. Uh, and uh, here, pretty much all the components are blended, blended in max lighting. And here's a look at the height map with just a gray albedo rendered in, uh, in Toolback 3. All right, so creating the albedo. Uh, so basically, when I work, um, when I start working on the, on the albedo, uh, as I said earlier, uh, I start by extracting masks from my height map, and I uh, fill this mask up with flat colors just to separate all my elements. Then uh, I start by mixing up like grunge map and noise, uh, plugged into gradient map to um, create like subtle variation in that colors. 
and I uh, usually use uh, my HBL node to blend these colors together. And what I like to do usually is to uh, darken my valleys and lighten my peaks, but it has to stay subtle because you really don't want to uh, add some shadow information in your albedo, it's not the plan. But uh, it, it works pretty well usually to do that. And finally, to uh, uh, finalize my uh, albedo, I had to create a bunch of uh, painted patterns. So uh, to um, go fast on these patterns, I just reused uh, one of my uh, circular molding that I plugged into a gradient map. Uh, so it was uh, pretty handy to work that way, and uh, I ended up with the, this result pretty quickly. And here's the final render on the right with the reference uh, on the left and more final renders. All right, so uh, if you want to take a look more in depth at the graph, uh, the file is available on my Gumroad, so the package contains a full SBS file with 30 graph, all well organized with frames. Uh, I've also released a bunch of my materials on my ArtStation store, so if you're interested, just go check them out. Uh, all right, so project breakdown number two, uh, creating a damage wall full in substance designer. So here are a few renders on a sphere and the environment. Uh, so here what I would like to mention is that uh, when I start to work on a material, I always have in mind an environment that I want to create out of it. And here the plan was to uh, create a damage wall that I could uh, use to create a sort of destroyed tunnel uh, from a hidden sci-fi base in the North Pole or something. Uh, and I also wanted to study in depth the layering of detailed material and uh, find uh, nice techniques to uh, connect them seamlessly. Here are more renders and uh, an albedo variation. So the project pipeline for this project is exactly the same than on the previous one, so we're not gonna go through it once again. So let's jump on the next step. So inspiration, reference, analysis. So if you take a look at the reference board, you have uh, an old concrete from broken bunker, you have damages, you have holes, you have bullet holes, you have rusted rebars, you have cracks, etc. Uh, I also wanted to add a sci-fi twist to that material, so um, I really love the game Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus, and um, I just collected a bunch of screenshots from the game and from the environment that I love the most. So uh, this screenshot are courtesy of Mr. Aggie Sanchez, so thanks to him for allowing me to use them. Uh, and basically I took a lot of inspiration for the markings, the logos, and the color palette. So once again, before to jump on the, before to tackle on the, on the creation of the material, uh, let's study and identify the main elements. So you have a concrete bunker wall, you have plaster, you have peeling paint, you have damages and impacts, you have rebars, you have bullet holes, you have markings and logos, and finally you have aging and dripping rust. So set up a plan. Uh, so uh, once again, to simplify the construction of my height map, uh, I decided to separate all the elements that we've mentioned in a separate graph to help me out to stay organized. So this time the height is made out of five subgraphs. So here are my main steps. So creating the material, concrete, plaster, peeling paint, uh, creating the damages and the bullet holes, creating the rebars, blending all the elements together in the main graph, creating the markings and logos, and finally creating the albedo roughness and metallic out of masks. So creating the height map. So for the concrete, uh, basically concrete is pretty often made out of a uh, wood structure that is uh, covered with uh, liquid concrete. And uh, that's why you usually can see like this kind of wooden pattern underneath the surface of, uh, of the walls. Uh, and it's the kind of interesting details that I love to add in my materials. So uh, to create that pattern, uh, I used that technique. So I, I took a parallel noise and I plugged into a directional blur. Uh, I used a gradient dynamic with a gradient linear one uh, tiled 50 times. Um, I used a non-uniform blur, then I'm warping it uh, I directional warp it, I use a bunch of slow blurs, and uh, once I get my first wooden pattern, uh, what I've done is that I've uh, duplicated that recipe two times, 
and uh, I've just played, a played around with the settings of, uh, of that, uh, that small graph to create like other variations. And I'm basically just blending them together to, to get a subtle variation in my uh, final wooden pattern. So for the rest of the graph, uh, I created a, uh, a uh, I created a, like small details for the, the concrete surface with large noise. And I uh, try to find a good balance between my wooden pattern and uh, the, the surface of the concrete. Then I added some uh, planks with a tile generator, or tile sampler here, I think. Uh, and I uh, tilted them with uh, gradient uh, information. Uh, I added a bunch of micro noise from large to small to add some subtle details on the surface. And I finally uh, added um, impacts using a generator. So that's a, a pretty simple one. Uh, the cool thing in designer is that when you're like creating a small generator like that, you can import it in uh, another graph and just play around with the random seed and create like a, a crazy amount of variation like what I'm doing here. So it's super, uh, super handy to do that. So for the paint, uh, it's a pretty simple material. Uh, for the surface, I've created, a, I've created it just uh, using a, a, a bunch of grunge map and, and noise. And for the cracks, I uh, just created them using um, a distance node, uh, an edge detect, and a few slow blurs and directional warp. So nothing crazy here. All right, so for the damages, uh, I use a Perlin noise as a base. Uh, then I clamped with a histogram scan to create a, a first mask. Then I'm using a slow blur set to max to uh, basically distort the silhouette of my shape. And I'm repeating the process again and again with different cloud, um, with uh, uh, different settings. And I'm basically here extending my shape and chiseling the silhouette of my mask. So uh, once I, I get the result that I wanted, uh, I started to uh, tackle the inside of the sculpt. Uh, so I created volumes with a non-uniform blur grayscale. Then I added and subtracted different grunge map uh, to create variation in the depths. And I finally integrated uh, a few noise from large to small to create, its, uh, create subtle details on the surface. So for the bullet holes, uh, it's a pretty simple graph here, but uh, you can notice that I've worked, uh, I've worked inverted because I knew that I was going to uh, subtract that shape from the, from the other uh, layers. So for the rebars, it's just a gradient linear two uh, that I plugged into a tile generator to create my wireframe structure. So uh, to break the alignment, I slightly uh, warped my rebars using uh, my height map. And uh, I just uh, played around with the depths by, uh, um, uh, to bend like the overall structure uh, by using like two perlin noise, one blended in multiply and one in add linear. All right, so combining the elements, so I had to create a bunch of masks to layer all my components. So here, basically, I'm just extending uh, my Perlin noise that I've used at the very beginning by uh, using the same technique with the slow blur set to max. Uh, so it was pretty handy to work that way. And I uh, forgot to mention for the plaster in the center, uh, it's basically uh, the same material than the paint, but I just added like a few noise uh, in the final graph to create subtle variation. Uh, I also had to create like a um, subtle transition uh, between all my layers. So uh, it's pretty subtle on the, on the height on the left, but I basically use a, a bevel node to um, uh, create a sort of slope around my mask and give a sort of thickness to all my different layers. So uh, I get the result that you have on the right and I basically use that mask uh, blended in multiply uh, to, to get some seamless results. Uh, I also created a peeling effect so uh, I'm, I plug my mask into a non-uniform blur grayscale to get the result that you have in the center and I've added that mask in add linear on top of the, the height paint that you have on the right. And if you look at the render, you can clearly see that the, the paint is going up around my damaged area. So this is what's going on usually uh, when you look at a broken, broken wall. 
I also created a bunch of cracks, so uh, the large ones uh, impact all the layers and impact even the, the concrete itself. Uh, so it was a, um, a good way to like uh, uh, connect all my layers together. So for the small, mini, and micro, they're uh, just visible on the surface of the paint. So to create these cracks, um, it's pretty simple. It's like uh, I just used a cell four uh, with some directional warp and uh, Nash Detect. And I'm also adding a peeling effect so the, with the same technique that I showed you uh, on, the, on the paint layer. Uh, and to uh, localize my micro cracks only around my damages, um, I created the mask that you have on the right, uh, so uh, based on a curvature smooth. So basically here you, uh, you will just display the micro cracks uh, in the white areas. So it gives a, a pretty natural feeling. So if you look at the render, uh, you can see that you have a lot of subtle variation on the surface of the paint. And you can see like that pretty subtle webbiness due to the peeling effect as well. So to finalize my height, uh, I just had to create a, a bunch of pebbles. So uh, it was a super small detail. So I just used reach bell shape uh, in a tile sampler to create that. But here what I wanted to highlight is uh, the mask that I've created. Uh, it's basically uh, created out of my normal. So I've uh, used an RGBA split to extract my green channel. And uh, I've clamped that using an histogram scan. And I ended up with the mask that you have at the, at the top. So uh, once plugged in my mask map input, uh, it allowed me just to uh, spool my reach bell uh, at the bottom of the broken parts. So it's pretty, pretty handy. Here's a look at the final height and a breakdown. If it works, yeah. And some renders. So just the height map and some AO. All right, so for the albedo, um, I always start by using like a, a, non, a, a, a mix of uh, noise and grunge map plugged into gradient map. Uh, and I usually pick values from uh, scan references. Uh, I then use like HSL uh, node to slightly tweak my tints. And uh, I blend my, my gradients together uh, by using an HBAO node that I clamp more or less. Um, that's pretty much it for the, for the albedo part. So here I'm doing this on the plaster and the pane. And I start to add some markings using uh, simple square shapes to create lines. So here are a few close up from my uh, references. So these are like the, the logos that I love the most. So uh, I took inspiration from that to create uh, a, few, uh, a few masks in designer. Uh, I also created a different uh, paint colors. So uh, I have a, a blue one, a white one, a red one, and a black one. And I use this mask to layer all these different colors and a bunch of transform 2D to just uh, place them around on my composition. So for the rebars, uh, I used gradient map to create a mix of rust and old metal. Uh, to spread the rust around my rebars, I used uh, an inverted AO. And uh, I finally added some licks. And just going to show you the mask that I've created for this. So I just used a, a tile sampler to spawn white disc uh, along my rebar's mask. And um, I set my non-uniform blur uh, grayscale like on the, the screenshot that you have here. Uh, and I was able to like create this kind of effect. Uh, I also used my uh, height map to uh, vector morph my, uh, my licks to get like uh, some subtle variation in the in the leaks. So finally, uh, using a mix of AO and Grange map, uh, I add a final touch uh, with some dirt and dust. And I finally uh, tweak the, the, the final values with a contrast and a bit of sharpen. And here's the final albedo and a breakdown. And the final render. And that's pretty much it. Thanks.
Do you, do you have any questions? Okay. Um, hi. So first and foremost, amazing work. Seriously blown away. Thanks a um, lot, man. So also 3D artist, but I just picked up designer. So I'm okay. fresh into it. All right. And so my question is that is, you know, I know ZBrush, I know, you know, all these, you know, 3D programs, and I know that this is a completely kind of different animal. Yeah. What do you recommend I should keep in mind or like the mentality? What should I, you know, going from one to the other? you know, and plan to, you know, always keep going back and forth, you know, what should I be keeping in mind? Well, it, it's totally up to you, basically. If you really feel comfortable in ZBrush and you, you, you love to sculpt things manually with, like, uh, your, your Wacom pen and you're, like, you know, drawing your volumes, etc., uh, you can definitely get, like, a, a sort of hybrid pipeline with, like, the two methods. Or you can use Maya or another 3D program to create like intricate shapes. If you're not comfortable in designer, uh, you can just mix the, the, the two things. But uh, in my case, on that project, I really wanted you know, to, to challenge myself on creating like this kind of intricate shapes. And it was super interesting to just study how to, to find a way to like create a face, create a vase, create a ropes, etc. But it's totally up to you. Um, you can like uh, keep working with different programs. Um, there is not a uh, like a there's not a rule. It's it's totally up to you, man. So like with this, you know, good idea to like work with it, stay with it, and you know get comfortable with it, and then later on, if I want to bring in the other aspects, then go that way. But take some time and just focus on yeah. designer. Yeah, sure. Okay. And you can also, you know, just uh, try to experiment the creation of a few components, but like uh, start with simple shapes. Then uh, you can keep like, you know, practicing the both, and uh, it's just going to get better and better. Yeah. Thank you very much. No worries, man. Thanks. Uh, hello. Hey. Um, first off, I want to say thank you so much for giving this talk because just <laughs> what you said right now is really helpful and I can't wait to implement uh, some of that stuff into my Thanks own work. Thanks a lot, man. Um, so uh, my first question, if I only have time for one, um, is uh, I noticed that that graph, or at least the two graphs, were massive. Yeah. Um, and um, I wanted to know, were there any, like, uh, were there any tricks or things that you learned along the way of developing uh, these two materials to help optimize the graphs in general, just to cut down, like, in the subgraphs or just in the general general graph. Well, basically, um, I decided to like extract all my components because at some point it was like uh, a bit hard just to update everything, basically, especially in 4K. But uh, what you can do is also basically converting uh, some of your subgraph uh, as bitmaps, and, and in theory, it's uh, it's just it's less less heavy to do that. So uh, this is maybe a part of the answer, but um, yeah. Okay, um, and then uh, the second question I had um, was, oh, the, uh, I remember in the uh, Baroque uh, tiling material, uh, you mentioned that you had, there was a node that got the height information uh, to help lay around the uh, subgraph uh, textures, or um, I was wondering like what that, the name of that node was again to, uh, to, like you were extracting the the masks based off of height. Uh, I'm not sure to. Do you mean are you talking about the light node, the yes, one I used to node. get the slopes? Yeah. Yeah, it's called the light nodes. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's pretty handy in in some cases. All right, thank you. No worries, man. Hi, Jonathan. Amazing talk and work, by the way. Um, I was just <laughs> Thanks, wondering, because you mentioned like one or two custom nodes, what are some custom nodes that you find yourself using a lot and that you would recommend off of source or share or, or share? <laughs> well, basically, it's the, the effort, FX perspective node is, is pretty handy, and this is the one that I use the most. But I also use, um, uh, recently, a fine one called, uh, uh, I think it's Dialet Erode. Uh, and it also uh, it allows you to create a sort of pinch uh, on some shapes, or uh, uh, you can do a, a pinch or a push, basically, if you uh, a Max or a Maya user, you see what I mean? Uh, so it's useful for uh, cracks, you know, if you want to like uh, uh, contract 
the, 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 the mask, it works pretty well. So this is the, the two that I, that I use the most. I also use um, the Easy Splatter uh, that is pretty handy. So uh, everything is available on Substantiator and it's for free. So uh, just, uh, yeah. Cool, man. Thank you very much. No worries. Hi there. Hey. Uh, I saw that you um, you had a gum road on the, the first project. Do you have other uh, walkthroughs on there on your gum road page? Oh yeah, uh, actually the my materials that are available in my art station store are also available on my gum road. Uh, so you can uh, find the, the four that I've released and uh, I'm planning to release the, the damage wall as well pretty soon, uh, uh, probably like in a week or two. Uh, it's, it's already, uh, it, it's, it's prepared already, so I, I should be able to share it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Hi, how's it going? Um, I was wondering, like, when you become one of the more famous material artists, does it ever, does it feel like the volume that you move on a digital marketplace like Gumroad, could it ever be a viable, you know, occupation, just like selling, selling your assets, selling tutorials, stuff like that? Uh, well, it's it's not my main occupation, basically. Yeah, no, I understand, but like, yeah. it's kind of best case scenario because you're one of the more famous material artists. Do you think you could ever move out and just kind of work on your own? Because that's the dream, right? So. <laughs> well, uh, basically, I, I I've been asked by many people to to share my materials because they wanted to like learn more stuff about it. So uh, that's that's why I decided to create a game road because. Uh, like I think two years ago, I didn't have any Gamrod or anything uh, shared on the internet, but uh, I received a lot of emails, like people asking me, "How have you, how have you done that? Uh, how have you done this, etc." So I just decided to like release them, but uh, it's it's more about you know sharing stuff for the community and you know help people out because you know uh, we're all 3D artists. Uh, we're just making images. And you know, sharing your knowledge is something super important. You know, cool. uh, you even you're even like learning stuff on yourself when you're like trying to teach to people. So when I'm breaking up like my own uh, my personal work, I'm like uh, you know uh, seeing it in a in a different way, and I'm like um, I learn stuff even when I'm like uh, you know breaking breaking them down like that and adding comments and stuff like that. Because sometimes just doing stuff without especially thinking about it, it's like automatic. But when you have to like think about it and explain it, you're like, okay, yeah, I've done that because I wanted to do that effect. So it's even useful for me to, to do that, actually. Okay, thank you. All right. Hey, thanks for sharing your work. Um, in your day-to-day -day, uh, work, how do you balance things that you probably should be modeling and things that you probably want to try to take as a challenge, like the ceiling? Well, uh, it's it's totally uh, uh, it, it depends of the time that you have to to uh, to produce your material. Uh, if you have to uh, publish your data and submit your stuff at the end of the day, uh, you're probably not gonna like uh, uh, play around like that and create like uh, faces and stuff, but if you have the time to do it, uh, just do it because it's uh, it's a super interesting exercise. Uh, but in production, um, the the cool thing now is that I'm 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 going pretty fast on creating like this kind of patterns. Uh, but if I have a day or two to create a material, uh, sometimes I'm uh, using like uh, height libraries because I unfortunately don't have time to create everything. But it's more useful when you have a specific design to create in Designer. Uh, and you know how to produce it directly in designer without using any external program. You just go straight to the point and keep uh, stay in designer and just finalize everything in it. So, yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Well, thank you.